Welcome back. This is Defender Fabrication. My name's Scott, and this is the first video in what is planned to be a bi weekly video series to include everything that's going on with respect to this shop. You may have noticed that in the intro, I didn't say Defender Chassis, I said Defender Fabrication. I've changed the name of the channel to more accurately re reflect what it is that, uh, that we're doing here. Uh, I'm still going to show and, and uh, detail work that I do on race car chassis, but in addition, uh, there's interest in you know the development of the shop and, and this piece of property that, that the shop sets on, uh, including the wood shop that is going to be in the uh, old two-stall garage that was on this property. The focus of the channel will shift a little bit, uh, but uh, hopefully we'll get you the same great content. One of the things that I'd like to focus on with this bi-weekly video series is uh, racing. Uh, it's one of the things I like to do, and I'd like to bring you uh, details uh, of what I get into with respect to that. Although I haven't been able to do much of that since I blew my car up a year ago when we first started the shop project. Uh, repair of that car, well, you'll see that in uh, upcoming episodes. But in addition, uh, this weekend I've managed to catch a ride in a friend's car. I'll be able to get back on the track this weekend, and hopefully in, the, uh, in two weeks I'll have details of how that went. In the last couple of weeks, one of the things that I've been trying to do is the other building, the two-stall garage, is getting that cleared out, getting those tools and materials that we had stuck in there during the move over here into the main shop and getting those into a place where I know where they're at and I'm able to utilize them. But in addition, organizing that building over there so that uh, Eventually, that will trans transition into a, a uh, working wood shop. Uh, let's go take a look at uh, what that building looks like right now. One of the things we've been working pretty hard on here in the last couple of weeks is getting this building cleared out. If you're uh, a follower of the shop build series, you know that this building was already here when we got here. It's been a great uh, help keeping material staged and things of that nature. And this is where all the overflow went when we made the move. This building was actually so full that there was just one path that went around and so you could get to the other door and open the other door. And we've probably pulled about half of what was in here out and what's in here is a little bit spread out. Now what we're trying to do is actually get some shelves. I've got a neighbor here that has some, some shelves for sale that I'm trying to uh, negotiate on purchasing. And we'll probably put along that whole back wall uh, a set of shelves that uh, came out of a local glass factory. And uh, they're all four feet wide and two feet deep. Once that's done, I think we can get everything up off the floor, get stuff on the shelves, and anything that'll be left out here will just be uh, uh, equipment. And so what we're going to use this building for is if uh, we've got a vehicle that uh, we don't want to leave in the shop while other work's going on, it can come over here. Or the chassis jig, if it's in the way, it can be, uh, it can be moved over here. Or this will be set up as a wood shop. One of the things that I've managed to get completed here is these wood racks. It doesn't seem like a whole lot but it, it picked up a lot of stuff that was, uh, that was on the floor and in the way and had to be stepped over. And all we did was, um, and I've used these type of wood racks before, is we've got uh, two befores. There's actually four that uh, go up and tie into uh, the, uh, the roof truss. We took that uh, two before that goes up and down the wall and cut a little notch out so that when we scabbed that two before on the side of the roof truss that it hit dead center in the middle of that two before. That two before is screwed to the wall in uh, two locations just directly above these brackets. Let me move you around and show you how these brackets are made. Really other than these two befores, uh, all the material to, uh, to make these wood racks is just stuff that I had on hand. Uh, this is uh, some 3 8 inch, uh, probably more like quarter inch plywood. Uh, there's a couple more racks in here that are made out of uh, 5 8 plywood just because that's what's on hand. And all this is in between is uh, a 2 before. And these, these 2 befores here could have been a little bit longer, but these were off cuts from uh, other work that was going on. I didn't really want them to be too far out anyway. So all this uh, plywood does is screw to that vertical 2 before in the back. And like I mentioned before, there is a concrete screw about 3 inches above the top of this rack that goes into the concrete. To account for any twisting force that this uh, this rack may put on on that two before, and every one of these rack locations has that that concrete screw above it. If you've kept up with the shop build series, one of the things that uh, you'll know here recently that we've been trying to do is complete the office and the bathroom. Part of that is connecting the uh, sewer line. Now we tried to do that uh, last fall. 
uh, when we had a mini excavator by uh, digging some ditches. And that uh, project got put aside for some other activities and I'd like to show you where we're at. Let's take a look. One of the things we've gotten accomplished is uh, this area had become quite overgrown. If you remember from one of the shop updates, I rented a mini excavator and dug several ditches. Uh, one of which was to try to make the connection to the sewer for the shop. What I had anticipated was that there was an existing sewer line that we were going to tie into. That sewer line travels right underneath where the camera is, is now setting. And if you see an orange flag up there, uh, passes directly under that orange flag and goes up around the back of the cistern and tied into the house on the back side, which used to set right here behind uh, where the shop's located now. What I anticipated was digging a, a ditch straight from the building over where that orange flag is, but turned out that the sewer line was uh, too high in elevation to make the tie. It actually would have pitched back into the building. We took a shot and made a, took a 45 degree angle off the building and came right through here and tried to make a tie in. Once again, I'm not sure whether we had, didn't have enough pitch or uh, whether it was also still at that point too high, uh, but either way it wasn't gonna work. So these ditches have laid open for about six months. Uh, or better actually, and um, they had become quite overgrown and quite a challenge to um, uh, just walk around, made access to the building a little more difficult. I said, you know what, let's go ahead and get this thing filled back up. Uh, when I did uncover the existing sewer line, I damaged it with the uh, bucket of the mini excavator. So what we had to do was uh, uh, initiate a repair, cut a section of pipe out, replace it before we could backfill. Now I did backfill with sand on top of the repair so any settling should uh, keep from damaging that line. And what, we, what we're trying to do is maintain uh, that existing sewer line because in the future there may be um, a house or something back here behind the shop or a trailer uh, as like a temporary living condition uh, that would, would utilize that existing sewer line. So that's why that orange flag is still up there. That indicates uh, that had actually gotten backfilled by virtue of digging this, this other ditch. And I needed to, to uncover that again and make a repair there as well uh, because I do remember damaging that line. In addition to the sewer line connection, there was also a connection out back to the cistern so that we would have uh, rainwater to use uh, for uh, activities such as washing cars, things of that nature. So let's go take a look and see where we're at on that. Here we are on the, uh, on, on the back side and uh, you can see the pile of dirt that's left over from the excavation. The plans for that are to, uh, are to use it uh, in some other places on the property. What I wanted to do here in the last uh, week was this whole area had become overgrown. Another ditch that we had dug for the connection of the cistern to the building. There will be a pump and a bladder tank in the utility room that will allow us to pump and use water out of the cistern. What I had done before we backfilled the garage, this, the new shop, I had uh, had them put a pass through in the foundation and we put a half inch water line through the wall then we backfilled and that water line was rolled up out here on the back side now that that water line was half inch and I've since found out that that was not going to be adequate for the suction line because the pump is going to be in the utility room and it'll suck through that line out of the uh, cistern and that was not going to be adequate so we've upgraded to a, a one inch line so that line is, is sitting there what we still have to do is to excavate that again around that area insert that line into the cistern far enough that it will reach the bottom of the cistern put a foot valve which is simply a, a screen on um, on that line and somehow weight that down so that it stays at the bottom of the cistern. I want to take a minute here and show you something that's going to be upcoming. As soon as we get a shot, we're going to rebuild this transmission jack. I picked this up at a auction. This transmission jack, although it will jack all the way up, it only does so probably the last 10-20% of the pedal stroke does it actually get any move. Hopefully it's just a seal or something of that nature and uh, what I've done is I bought a seal kit. We'll get this thing torn apart and uh, get it rebuilt. Hopefully have a good uh, transmission jack for under the lift. 
One of the things we've been working on here since the last update is a platform to store this fiberglass body. There's a, a challenge in storing this body. What we've done up to date is just set it on the chassis jig and support it with whatever lumber was around just to try to keep it uh, supported adequately. And that's just not working out. And what I'd like to do is get on this chassis jig and, and finish up some features on that that we didn't uh, do when we initially built it. And uh, so to do that, I need someplace else to put the body. And I don't want to just set it out here on the floor somewhere and then have it get bumped around and, and uh, possibly get damaged. And I'd like to be able to also uh, move it to the other building if necessary. So what we've built here is a three quarter inch plywood platform with a two before frame underneath of it. And underneath that, to give it some wheels without investing in you know, dedicated casters, what I did was I, I've got, I had two of these uh, furniture dollies. And I've used these to, you know, put a cylinder block on or, uh, you know, whatever uh, as a temporary way to keep them mobile. And I bought two more of those. So on each corner of this, what you've got is one of these furniture dollies, and uh, that provides the, uh, the wheels. On the next update, we'll have this body on here, and I'll show you how we've got it tied down. Now, most recently, as far as paying work here in the shop, I did get a project in to do a roll cage for a UCC truck. Now, UCC is, that stands for Ultimate Callout Challenge. It's a competition for diesel trucks. It includes uh, three aspects. One is to pull a sled, just like a you know, regular uh, pulling trucks. In addition, there is a horsepower contest where the truck will be placed on a mobile dyno. Uh, last year's contestant with the highest horsepower was at 2,447 horsepower. The third and final aspect of that competition is a quarter mile drag. And I believe last year's fastest was an 862. This customer contacted me. It's somebody I've known for uh, quite a while here in the area. And he expects to build somewhere in the neighborhood of 2,200 horsepower. He's got a 2009 Dodge truck. I have put a cage in it. Uh, the twist to, to all of this was after I had completed the cage, we found out that the Division Three uh, technical director does not allow something that I put on the truck. And I'll insert some pictures here as I'm talking, uh, but what we did, this is a full-size truck. It's got to have the cage attached to the frame. In the past, this has been acceptable, but uh, they're not allowing it anymore. So I have to, to take the outriggers that come from the frame up to the floorboard we're going to cut those off. We're going to cut through the floorboard, splice a tube to make a connection then to go directly to the frame. Now what we did, as you'll see in these pictures, is that the way we set it up was that the truck could actually be unbolted uh, from the frame so the cab could be removed. Hopefully in the next episode, uh, I'll have details of how I made that made those changes to make that truck legal. You know, these are the things you run into when you do this type of work. Uh, rule books are sometimes subjective. Uh, you know, the NHRA rule book is really somewhat vague. There's just a few pages on you know doing uh, roll cages and such. Whereas when you get faster than say 850, you they revert to the SFI specs, which you know on their on their own for you know a very small portion of cars. Uh, you know, has you know a dozen, dozen and a half of pages to detail how they want to see those those chassis done. So anyway, we're going to make the changes. I'm going to go ahead and show you the rest of the pictures of uh, of this truck, and uh, I'll see you on the next episode. If you have any questions, let me know. If you like the idea of this video series, please give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't subscribed already, please do so. And I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanks.